Hello, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Hook, and I work with Booz Allen Hamilton to support the NASA research and analysis team. I'm here virtually with Dr. Jack Kay, the Associate Director for Research of the Earth Science Division within NASA's Science Mission Directorate. He is here to talk more about the Space Apps COVID-19 challenge, particularly challenge number one. It addresses the impacts of COVID-19 on the Earth system and the Earth system response. So people might be thinking, you can't see viruses from space. Um, but Jack, how are space-based observations from NASA and other space agencies going to help researchers better understand the impacts of COVID-19? Well, <clears throat> when human activities on the surface change because of COVID, um, economies uh, uh, shutting down or hunkering down and people not traveling and factories not operating, um, <clears throat> that means that there's less activity on the surface. There may be less fossil fuel combustion, certainly uh, less traffic, whether it's cars on the ground, planes in the sky, ships on the sea. Um, all of those things that, that there's natural byproducts from human activity. Um, and uh, when, when the human activity changes anywhere on the planet, um, that's the kind of thing that satellites are good at looking at because they can see the land surface, they can see some of the pollution that gets into the atmosphere. Um, uh, depending on the nature of the observations, there's, there's quite a bit of things that, that one can see and the observations have the potential to be global. So uh, if something happens in one country, the, 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 uh, the polar orbiting satellites that NASA and, and its international interagency partners have um, can see them. And uh, it, when it's in Europe, we can see them. When it's in the Americas, uh, we can see them. One of the, the great things about satellites is this ability to get um, more or less equivalent quality data anywhere. So it's one set of tools that really can be uh, applied to study the, the similar processes, but uh, <clears throat> how they may play out differently <clears throat> in different countries around the world, which is such a big part of the the uh, COVID um, pandemic, uh, because there's really very few places that have been spared. They've all um, had impact and they've all had to respond. Are the, which of these impacts uh, to the Earth system are scientists already measuring? And what is easier for them to see and what's more difficult? Um, a lot of the first things that people were looking at were related to air pollution. Uh, when you have fossil fuel combustion, uh, nitrogen oxides, especially ni nitrogen dioxide, uh, get formed as uh, byproducts of the fossil fuel combustion, and, and it's a pollutant. Um, and it, when you combine that with sunlight and other trace gases, you can end up with a formation of um, ozone, which is an air pollutant, it's, uh, uh, particularly harmful to people with asthma or, or uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, but NO2, it, it's in some sense, you can look at it as, as significantly, but not totally, a byproduct of a fossil fuel combustion. Um, and you tend to have fairly large signals against small backgrounds in areas where you have a lot of fossil fuel combustion. You can see the NO2 uh, from satellites. It's not a trivial measurement, because uh, you've actually got to look through all the NO2 in the stratosphere to see the NO2 close to the ground in the troposphere. But people have been doing that for a number of years, um, uh, starting with the satellites in Europe and then with some of our satellites. The, uh, the, uh, there's an instrument on your satellite that we launched in 2004, instrument called OZI, uh, OMI for Ozone Monitoring Instrument that was provided by the Netherlands and Finland. Um, that looks at, um, at NO2 and you know, we have a long time history uh, so that we can compare what we're seeing this year relative to what we've seen in, in prior years. Um, the Europeans, through the European Commission, the European Space Agency launched a, a satellite a couple of years ago with an instrument called uh, Tropomi on their Sentinel-5P satellite that, that does beautiful maps uh, kind of thing. It's got sort of better spatial coverage than, than OMI does, but it doesn't have as many years of, of data to allow you to sort of compare the current data to our prior data, but the uh, between Trope OMI getting the pictures and now OMI people putting things out, one can look at the NO2 uh, concentrations this year, compare them to previous years, and uh, be able to look, say, as the economy slowed down at different times in different places and to see those signals. Um, 
And uh, th th that's probably one of the things that people have been looking at the most. Um, but as people may look at, well, since NO2 can be a precursor for ozone, um, can we see signals in ozone? Um, that's a lot harder. Uh, there's been questions about uh, in areas where there's been a lot less fossil fuel combustion, can you see reductions in carbon dioxide? Um, that's much harder because there you're looking at typically smaller, uh, smaller signals against a bigger background. Um, and uh, so people are starting to look at that. Um, there may be other pollutants like carbon monoxide that people will be looking at. Um, and in all of those things, it's important to recognize that you can't just, you know, compare today with the previous day or this month with the previous month, because there's seasonal cycles, there's meteorological variability. You know, if you've got a warm spell, the atmosphere is going to behave a little differently than if you have a cold spell or, or if you have rain. Uh, so you can't just look at one observation and compare it to another observation and say, Oh, I see a difference. I understand what it is. You gotta gotta correct for these known um, variabilities. So, so it's the pollution that people have started looking at. But then people are starting to look at other things, and uh, I I'm not sure how far along they are get, getting results. So we've asked the community for ideas, and people are writing some proposals and and submitting it. So th there's always things like, well, if there's uh, less air pollution, well. Since what goes up must come down, um, you know, will we be able to see a difference in um, weather? I mean, you hear all the reports, like in Venice, they say the canals have been very clear um, compared to areas where they're normally quite um, polluted. So you may be able to see things in, in weather. And then, you know, if farmers are behaving differently because they're farming differently than they would otherwise, at some point you'll be able to see it on the land surface. But some of these things takes a while. Yeah, it's true. Um, and many of the countries and regions are anticipating longer term impacts, like you mentioned, um, also to just daily life and to travel. Um, do we have an idea of what some of the longer term effects that we might see in the environment are? Uh, it's, it's a complicated question because some of the things it's like um, when when the, the, the change stops and things return to normal, so the atmosphere will respond pretty quickly. Um, so it's it's hard to know. Um, you know, there's even a variety of other things, but that, um, you know, which ones last and which ones will sort of uh, sort of when the when things start back up, the system will respond quickly. Um, you have to figure that out. There's some things that 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 we know that we think will be fairly quick, um, but it's hard to know exactly. You know. Um, when there's fewer planes flying in the sky, um, you've got you, you fewer contrails, mm -hmm. um, which can affect a serious cloud formation. Now, we probably all had the experience. Some days you look up at the sky and you see these uh, the contrails crisscrossing each other. Um, well, with fewer planes flying, you're not going to see that. Um, when the planes start flying again more, um, they'll probably start right back up. Um, so, how long does the uh, the the any impact from not having nearly as many contrails for a period of time, I think that one will be fairly short, but um, um, it's hard to know. Whereas like if, if people have changed the way they're doing farming, um, that could be a while. Um, I saw one thing that said that, that, that sometimes what farmers do is they go out in the fields and do some uh, agricultural burning, set some small fires. Um, well, if they're not doing that as much because of the COVID. Um, well, uh, that means that you may see see that for a while, um, potentially, including in some areas. Uh, you know, are they going to do bigger fires later, or could natural fires come through and uh, in areas that otherwise would have been protected? So, you know, some of these things it's really um, hard to see exactly how it's going to play out. But you know, other than the longer it goes, um, you know, the more one can expect that um, uh, that there'll be uh, things to look at, uh, and uh, it's not. You know, maybe other people so that can better forecast exactly what they're going to be, but I'm I'm not one. Yeah. Um, so once we identify these impacts, like um, detecting fires or atmospheric response, um, what are some of the potential applications for these types of measurements that we're looking at? Well, the, the the first thing uh, that that I tend to think about, and I mean I'm a science guy, is. I'll call it a science application because 
one of the biggest challenges for studying the, the Earth is it can become very hard to disentangle um, the relative contributions of uh, human activities and natural processes. Um, so now we're in a, in a different regime where in some areas the natural, the, uh, the, the human uh, induced processes have changed significantly. So like in, in, in China when a lot of the factories shut down and, and a lot of transport stopped, in the, in the US a lot of traffic has stopped, you know, people aren't commuting nearly as much in the morning. So, so we actually have, it, it's sort of like a, a, a rare opportunity to take advantage of a, a, of a you know, unintended and undesired experiment really, uh, where th there's a significant change in human um, forcing but the natural forcing probably hasn't changed that much. So if you're trying to understand the relative contributions of human and natural forcing, it's a, in, in some sense, it's a great opportunity to be able to look at the, the situation where the natural system, uh, impacts of natural forcings are proportionally larger than they are during other times because the human activities are, are smaller. So, so it gives us a chance to look at the world in a way that we don't normally get to see it. So there's a, um, a, a, a science application associated with that. Um, and sometimes what that science can do also is, is give people a chance to quantitatively test models that are used in ways that they may not otherwise get to do. So like with air pollution, um, you can um, test your models under a different set of conditions than normal. Maybe learn something more about the models which will help you improve them in the future. And if you have better air pollution models that can be used for better forecasting and um, uh, regulation and anticipation of hazards. Uh, so there's a societal benefit of having better models. Um, in other areas, it may um, really depend what the uh, uh, things are. Again, if, if there's impacts on water pollution, uh, say if one sees less water pollution, um, one can try to back out, all right, um, you know, how much of the improvement is because of, say, decreased deposition from the atmosphere. Um, and can they then apply that knowledge to improve our understanding of water pollution and um, and lead to better models there, and <clears throat> on and on and, and other kinds of things that um that uh, we could see if um, you know we, we can learn something about the uh, changes in clouds associated with uh, fewer contrails that may be something that can people put into weather forecasts. Um, the other thing that's worth noting is that a lot of times. Airplanes, they're also taking meteorological data when they're flying. That data gets fed into the meteorological models. Um, so, um, you know, that can actually mean that the models won't have as much data coming into them as they have in the past. And one can learn something about the, the, the models and the, and the value of different uh, data because now you've got different data coming in. So you, you try to learn and, and use whatever you can to um, uh, to get out of it. And, and I think there's probably a variety of other um, applications that, that um, I haven't really thought about, but you know, the expectation is that um, the longer things go, the more other, uh, other people will be doing it and come up with some good ideas. And of course, I think part of the idea of the hackathon is to engage others in thinking about that and adding to the, the body of knowledge and the ideas about how, how what we see uh, can be made uh, more useful. And is that uh, part of the benefit for introducing this challenge to space apps, or do you have broader hopes for the types of benefits that we might get from introducing the challenge? I mean, there's a variety of things. One is, is that yeah, if people can can do something that that helps us understand our, our home planet better, and and what happens when uh, human induced forcing changes, and how to discriminate among human and natural forcing. Um, that's great if it can help us uh, provide uh, information that can be made more useful to policy and decision makers. Uh, that's a good thing. And, and frankly, as a fringe benefit, if um, people spend more time looking at the data and come away with a increased appreciation and, and understanding and recognition of the, the, the value of the, the data, that may be something that they can carry with them and apply to a wide variety of things into the future. So the, the, um, the, the potential benefits go way beyond the hackathon. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give since in the hackathon, whether they're returning or this is their first time? First, I would say is, you know, have fun. 
um, you know, if you, you, you're going to do this, it should be because you want to do this and, and you're looking forward to enjoy it. Um, I would say, uh, kind of be bold, be brave. Don't be afraid to try something. Um, you know, the, the, the worst that can happen is, you know, you'll, you'll try something and you won't accomplish as much as, uh, as you would like, but you know, there's, there's no, no real downside that I can see to trying something and, um, uh, and, and not having it play out the way you wanted to, um, you know, nobody's gonna, um, you know, as far as I can anticipate, nobody's gonna say, well, gee, you tried something and it didn't work. I mean, I think mostly the response that you're gonna get from a lot of people is, hey, it's great that you tried. Um, and I guess the other thing that I would say is, you know, think about what it is that you can bring to the effort. Um, you know, we all have things to contribute and some of us it's maybe you know, science knowledge, some it may be computer skills, some it may be visualization capabilities, some it may be really compelling ways to tell a story, um, you know, to grab people's attentions. And, and you know, my sense on that, the, the, the hackathon kind of things is that it's, it's any and all of the above in, in combinations that they may vary a lot from one group to the next. Um, so, you know, especially if you're working in a team, um, you know, you try and build together a variety of skills and expertise and background uh, so that collectively you can do something that none of you can do individually. Um, and, um, you know, as I say, think creatively. Um, and, but as I said, I think have fun is, is a really important thing. Yeah, thank you so much, Jack. And uh, we look forward to seeing the results of this Space Apps COVID-19 challenge. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you.